Alright. I always throw this, I'm just kind of, just, part of it is going to define some stuff for you guys here. I, I have a, I've been told, pretty good take on things, but there's a direct relationship between IoT and IIoT. You know, we jokingly say, who knows the difference between the two? A lot of people say the letter I, indust industrial, right? And really what it is, and you set up, it's, it's just applications, right? IoT is, is, is pretty well defined. So that's what I'll start with is just an example of IoT. And some people don't think of it. Google Maps, right? What is Google Maps? So it's an application that's a GPS that tells you how to get to point A to point B. Until I put that up there, would any of you think of Google Maps as an IoT application? Probably not. There's this guy that's smiling because he understands why I say it. What is, how does Google Maps come up with all this, tells you how to get to point A from point B? And real simply put, and privacy people hate this, but if you have Google Maps on your phone, your phone is constantly sending your location, actually it's doing a little bit more than that. It's trying to figure out before it sends it, are you acting like you're in a car? Because you don't care about, you know, you don't want to take into account the guy walking down the street and add that into your algorithms because they're growing really slow, you know, a few miles an hour. They'll make it seem like traffic stop, right? So it, your phone is figuring out, am I near a road? Am I going to speed like a car? And you can't just say I'm going 35 miles an hour because what if happens if it stopped? Well, it adds all that data together. It's a lot of data. What does it do? It sends it up to the cloud, right? And they put all that data in there, and then that's when they do the cool things, right? Trying to wrap your head around all the math and all the algorithms that they're doing to, to decide to tell you, you know, how fast our car is going right now. And historical data, like right now, if you left here, chances are I live down near Chicago. Sorry for you Wisconsin people, I know we all hate each other, it's okay. Um, there's no traffic down in Chicago right now, but give it 10 minutes. So it's about 2.30, around 3 o'clock when Lake County gets busy and Abbott and all those guys, they leave from there. It'll predict, yeah, it's going to take you time to get down there. And by you get down there, there's going to be traffic, right? So if I put Google Maps in, it's going to predict. By the time you get there, there's going to be traffic. There's none now, but there's going to be in the future, right? Interesting enough, you say if you're going from here to Pittsburgh and you go during rush, it adds all this. It takes all this information does all this really cool math, you know, Google, Google, Google it, right? And tells you the best route to get from point A to point B. It's an IoT application. It's IoT because it does some simple things. It collects data, right? Collects data. Pure IoT, so will say puts it in the cloud. I'll tell you later, I don't believe that it has to be. It doesn't really matter. Does something with it, right? transforms it, does something with it, and then enables some perfect words of industry 4.0. Enable some application to give you information that you need, that you can consume. Causes an action that has some value to it. So I'll tell people all the time, it's like real simply put, you know, that's an example of IoT that a lot of people don't think of as IoT. Another example is, and I'll just describe this, this is something called pump alternation. If you're in the uh, sewer, metropolitan sewer districts, all the people that handle your wastewater and your river flows and all this stuff, you know. Depending on the crowd, I can always make a joke of what kind of job it is, but. <laughs> Simply put, what this is doing is, a, I like this because everyone has a sump pump in their house. That's all they are, they're big, giant sump pumps, mm -hmm. right? One pump turns on, it's gonna pump. Then the next one turns on, they cycle. You can't really, it's hard to detect, but one of the models that they look at is they wanna, the amount of water coming in is varying, so you can't say, well, this pump took five seconds, this one took five seconds, this one took seven seconds, then three, you can't, there's no fast rules, but if you look at this over time, pump one, Right? It's taking about five seconds, then it took four seconds. It took, but pump one and pump two are acting semi normally. But you'll compare that pump three to it. Pump three is taking longer to do the same work. Now that I tell you that, if I just, you just looked at this data, you'd have a hard time looking at that. Maybe, maybe not. Some guys would. But if you're looking at it, what about now, real quick, 
what would you, with knowing that, what would you think is going on with pump three? It's beginning to fail. Beginning to fail, might be inefficient. It's certainly not doing its job. So what should happen? It needs attention. So really what they did, the first application of this was, when we see patterns like this, notify, we're gonna send a work order. They actually, we interface the maintenance system. Send a work order, send someone out there. The next thing they had figured out was, well, he we collects a little bit more data, temperatures of the bearings, amp draws, water flows, or whatever. We can start to figure out another thing, because there's an interesting fact that happens in an industry is, it might be the pump going bad. Well, you send out your electrician or your pump guy, you know, that does that. It might also be the impeller, right? It's not, mo the pump's working fine, it's just the impeller got something, toilet paper into it, whatever it may be. It might have actually cracked, it might be broken. The thing is, that's two different technicians. So now, when not only do they want to do the work, what are the next step? They said, well, let's take a guess at what's happening so we send the right guy. And interesting, just a real simple example of doing that, they had a 70% reduction in their work orders that they had to send people out on, and a higher, uh, actually a lower rate of failure, because they were detecting stuff before it happened or when things got bad, and they were sending the right person at the right time. That's, you know, an IOT, II, industrial example. So next thing I like doing, let's see if I can do this one. Oh, messing up here. All right, went on Google. If you did it right now, you typed in Google and you said IOT infrastructure. I love playing this just because people will actually test me and I did it, I had to update it because it didn't come, the old one I had. Here's IOT, right? Sensors at the bottom, these things called edge gateways. You know, somebody's gonna sell you IIoT or IOT's edge gateways that, you know, internet, you know, compute, storage, I'm gonna store it, I'm gonna do things. This is IOT, right? Literally from Google. Interestingly enough, you know, we're a lot of manufacturing or industrial type people. I grabbed uh, from Tatsoft's website, their architecture of what they do and have done for years. It's something called the SCADA system. You could steal it from them, you could grab any Wonderware, whoever. This is right, right, PLCs. What do PLCs hook to usually? Instrumentation, sensors, right? The middle, a database, a SCADA server. What do you do at the top? You, you visualize stuff. Put the two next to each other. Quickly, what's the difference? There's a few things most people catch. One uses the network or networks, the other one uses the simple Ethernet, internet. Cloud, people bring up. Edge gateway, but what's the difference, right? What? Could be, right, there's a few things, right? But architecturally, they're not the same. What I am gonna tell you is the one on the right isn't, can be used as IOT, right? One's in the cloud. Does your data that you collect, does it have to be in the cloud to be IOT? Some people say yes, some people say no, I'll just say it doesn't matter, right? Because really, the value in IIoT or even IOT is not the data. It's the information, it's the actions that you cause it to do. Data by itself has no value, right? If Google just collected your information and put it in the cloud, said, here's what every car has done for the last 10 years. You know, you may be able to sell it. Uh, wait, that'd be Facebook. <laughs> right, it's just information. And you could use it, you get handed off to some people. I'm gonna give you some examples of data that was collected, no one had any context with, and later on figured out there's value. We have some case studies around it. And interestingly enough, to you know, toot the horn of our company, this was on our website, I got it from my boss 22 years ago. This is what we did, right? Connected to, we don't say sensors, there was SCADA, PLCs, H well, historians, but transforming data into actionable information. People in this room, it's funny because manufacturing and industry and everything is usually behind in technology. But in this space, we've been doing this for years. I mean, chart recorders and it's, we just had to. We just didn't call it. Now what I will tell you is the best thing about really I -O IOT, it's called IOT for a reason, right? They're coming on to IOT, which is this hot thing. One of the, there's a couple big things that the whole IOT movement have done is one, for sure, is even if you look at, the cost of data has dropped tremendously. 
you don't have to put up thousands of dollars you know of machine you don't have to but spend tens of thousand of dollars on a certain sensor and instruments right the proliferation of sensors and everything else like that the proliferation of ability to um, communicate remotely right I can tell you right now, you know, 15 years ago, if you wanted to put a, a something with cellular on something, it was impossible. And then all of a sudden, Coke and Pepsi decided to put sensors in their machines, and all of a sudden, the cellular companies had the ability to just have a data account. It, uh, they just changed the things. And the biggest thing it did is two things in particular. One is the cost. The cost of data has dropped tremendously. You know, we make fun of Google and all these other people all we want, but that's what it's done. But that's great. It's good for us. The second thing was there's tools. We'll talk about some of those in a little bit. Ones you've heard. I sometimes introduce What's the difference between IIoT and IoT? I'll tell you, another big difference is IoT hires a rapper, like Common, if you ever heard him. Have you ever seen a Microsoft AI commercial and all that stuff? The guy's a rapper, got paid millions of dollars, recorded a video, and it was played at the Super Bowl. Millions and millions of dollars. IoT, you get me. I got paid by getting a free cup of coffee, and this time they're recording it. Last time it was just you guys, at least they're recording it this time, right? It's just money and all this other stuff. But it's changed, it's changed the whole game what we do, and the tools are better. AI, machine learning, these are just more tools. Data scientists, you know, things that they've used are now becoming part of what we're doing in industry, and we can take advantage of it. And I'll go back to it. Back to Google Maps, you know, how you use it, where value comes from. We talked about Google Maps saying best way to get from point A to point B. I use it a little differently. It's Monday, I'm at work, I've got a ton to do. I'm preparing for this meeting, doing a bunch of stuff. I had a sales call on Tuesday, but my wife told me I had to be at my event for my son at seven o'clock at the high school. So what I wanted Google to tell me was, I want to get there at seven, you tell me the latest I can leave and still safely get there by seven, right? It worked for me, it was information that I had, and it was able to tell me that. It was able to say, hey, you gotta leave. Okay, I gotta be honest. I was at the golf course, I was having beers with my buddies, and I went to hang out there longer, <laughs> right? But it was useful because if I was late because I was at the golf course drinking beers, I'm definitely getting the frying pan upside the head, right? The key thing is, is it's how you use the data that's valuable to me. It's, it's the, like you said, industry four, what is, it's the application. What well, industry 4.0 does, it has a lot of applications that fit manufacturing and industry. IoT, or really it's data and context and everything that goes around it is important to it. Here, I gotta, we'll see if it, if I have music in here, let's see if this actually can get over it. And it really doesn't matter, so if it doesn't play right, really kind of unimportant, right? Baseball. How many people have seen the movie Moneyball? Right? Analytics in baseball. Unbelievable. This is this. What I just showed you, is that IoT? Well, no, it's not. It's, it's, a, commer it's a baseball game. We're going to add something to it, right? Because it is. There's the, right? There's all the data. There's cameras that are picking up speed of the pitch. Exit velocity. Right? It looks like it's going to be a thing. How quickly, look how far he went. His first step, his acceleration. All these things. Right? The whole game changed right around this time where they started looking at anyone that were baseball fans. What did we look at when I grew up was your batting average, your runs batted in. Now they're looking at release points, release speeds, exit velocities. And now they're shortening them. The Evo and the uh, great one is war. You guys ever heard of the term war? It's considered the metric right now in baseball. It's wins above replacement. It means the way you play the game, how many wins, the way you play, better than the replacement that would normally be yours. They usually say it'd be the best sub in the league. How many wins do you give to my team? Yelich has broken a record this year. If you look at his stats here in Milwaukee, right? 3.5 war. Best war in a month ever in the history of the game. You look at his stats, you understand it, right? Defense, all this stuff. It's huge. 
And interestingly enough, there's a stat in the Moneyball, 2006. And I gotta look at these numbers. The value that the analytics said was $4.2 million per win for a pitcher and 5.7 for position. Right? So if you have a three point something war, right, to add the numbers up. Interestingly enough, money goes up, right? 2017 was about triple that. It was about 10 or 11 million dollars for relief pitchers for war, around 15 for each win, 15 for starting pitchers, and 17.5 for position players. So think of that. If you end up with a four or five or whatever war, that win, you've given your team that many wins, now you can actually put value. Like if I believe this guy in a year is a five war times $17,000, he's going to make me as a business owner 75 to $80 million a year more. I might pay him half and that's all of a sudden, guess what guys? That's how they justified these 30 and $35 million a year contracts. They used all this weird data to actually decide how they're gonna pay these guys. I wouldn't even want to think about the math and all that that went into it, but you know what, there's math and algorithm people that get into it. But really start thinking about how valuable that is for them. In other words, you know, IIoT, right? Value in IoT. First off, hey, say I, what happens in a plane? There are whatever the number is. I know it's tens of thousands of sensors on a plane. I could look at it, but it's a huge amount of sensors on a plane. They're sending that data, and they've been doing it for years over the internet and in the cloud, and they have all this data. So Boeing knew when they had this problem in the 737, how that happened. Every, engine, every plane has a black box for a flight recorder, so even when they crash, they can tell you a lot of data, and people analyze that data left and right. That's obviously very important, but that's when something bad happens, right? Something, it crashed. Let's figure it out. Real value is can you do things beforehand or how you optimize things. And you think about an engine, the engine's running. The engine's sending a lot of data. This is how I'm operating. This is my fuel consumption. What you want to do, it's huge. Newer engines and new things, the fuel can be, is the most expensive thing in the airline industry. Makes sense, right? You're burning fuel. It's the most expensive thing they have to operate. They care about fuel efficiency. Well, airplane engines, they can run 10% less efficient. Something's happening. It could be something, maybe it's not a broken thing, maybe it's not running efficiently. Your car, you know, if you would normally get 24, all of a sudden you're making 22, for whatever reason, right? So they want to improve that. So they're constantly monitoring these things to optimize them, try to get the most fuel efficiency in what they do. But then they can start making decisions, such as, you know, flights going from LA to Dallas, Dallas, to LA, and this is uh, New York to Dallas, Dallas, and this is actually a true case study that's out there. This engine started operating a little bit strange. Its efficiencies had plummeted, right? It was chewing up more gas than normal. Well, they took all the information, someone quickly made a decision, says we gotta fix that, because it's costing us a lot of money now to fly this plane. But it went to Dallas, and they quickly were able to make a decision with all this information. It was presented right in front of them, saying this is not a safety issue, it's an efficiency issue. We're not running optimally. We're not at risk, like the first one, of crashing or having a major problem where we gotta divert and go someplace else, but we're not running optimally. And then they made a quick made a decision, well, really the best place to fix it's gonna be LA, so why don't we just have the plane go to LA? Yeah, we'll lose money and gas on that trip, but it needs to go there anyway. So we'll just keep going, right? Simple, simple, just giving people information to make really good decisions. When they started looking at things that way, they, that industry as a whole, as a note, I love the number, it's over a trillion dollars in fuel savings when they started looking at efficiencies of engines. They started retiring fleets. And the big reason they did that was a simple concept, is data in context. So I'm gonna do, and you get, it's for you guys to do it, quick little test, interactive, kind of fun. Right, John? You did it earlier. I'm gonna show up a grid, 10 by 10. Has a number one, two, three, four, one through 100. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, and this time I'll be legit. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds when I pick it up, try to find the number one, then the number two, and count your way up and see how far you get in 30 seconds. Ready? Go.
Okay, stop. About where'd you get? I know the numbers, which what most people get. Where'd you get? Come on. Stop. Twelve. Anyone higher? All right. It's usually ten to thirteen, somewhere in there. Nine. Nine. <laughs> and you even know the trick. <laughs> Come on. Now, interestingly enough, I'm going to give you some context. And by the way, you have to, it's best if you don't cheat. I'll just tell you what's going on. Don't start counting as you look for it. We're going to divide the screen into quadrants, right? One's there, two's there, three's there, four's there, five's there, six's there, seven's there, eight's there. A little bit of context, right? Okay? Don't start because then you're cheating, but go. Okay, stop. Where'd you get? The general thumb is you'll get twice as much. By the way, I gave you half as much time. Right? That simple bit of context made it a lot easier, right? It, it made the data more valuable. Now, and I'm going to tell you that that's what IoT is all about. Context is where the value is. Putting context around data. We'll explain that in a little bit. Just kind of keep that in your mind that it's important. Just raw data doesn't give you much. And a little bit of context around it makes the data a little bit more valuable. One other concept, everyone's heard of AI, right? Of artificial intelligence, robotics. Part of AI is something called machine learning. Weird math. Data scientists, all this other stuff. Kind of simplify it. If I told you right now that there's five pieces of data, think of your manufacturing or whatever, everyone gets it. pressure, temperature, humidity, whatever. That's what's on this screen. And then you have the left. 100% of the time you made good product, then the right, 75% of the time made bad product. Thing is, machine learning is mostly known for predicting things. I can go back, but. By the way, the left was the left, the right was right. I didn't change anything. What would you predict right now? Come on, I know it's the afternoon. What are you going to predict? Do I have to go back? See, you guys aren't paying attention. <laughs> that happens all the time. Right? What are you going to predict? You're making good product, right? And I'll skip. What are you going to predict now? And then we'll go to that, right? What would you predict if you saw the pattern on the left? You're making a good product. Predict on the right, probably making a bad product. Is it 75%? Or do you want to throw another piece of information in there? If you had to, how positive are you on the left that you're making a good product? Depends on how many points you're putting. Exactly. If that happened once and I made a good product, how confident are you? Yeah, 89, whatever. Pick a number. That's a hard one. That happened a million times, and every time we made a good product, you're about 99, you're not going to say 100. It's possible that we're not. If you're 99.99% sure that we're making a good product, look at the left. If this was a million samples 75% of the time, you'd say, okay, 25% chance we're making a good product, right? It is important that you have, not only that you see a pattern and context to that pattern, right? The context is good product, bad product. It's information. It's valuable information, right? You want to predict something. You want to predict that I'm making good product. Interestingly enough, if I look and now I've told you, so, so well, you look at the one on the left and you look at the one on the right, and yes, exactly is. The only difference between the one is the one I circled on the left and the one on the right. And if you move the one on the right up, and if I told you that was the pressure and you saw the stuff on the right, what would you probably tell someone to do? Increase the or increase it, move it to the other spot, right? It, whatever this means. Move it from there up there. Because when I'm down here, I'm making bad product. When I'm up there, I'm making good product. So what are you going to do? You're going to prescribe a solution. Assuming the rest of the data points are the same. Assuming the rest of them, right. There's a lot of variability in that, right? There's, there's things you can predict. Now, imagine if you were running and say the machine, this is, again, these are concepts, right? The machine was smart enough to say, well, if I do this, chances are I'm going to go from good to bad, and it does it on its own. That's the whole concept of machine learning. It's really not that. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of algorithms. There's, like you said, the assumptions. It's not that easy. 
But that's the concepts, right? It's going to predict something is happening and maybe prescribe a solution to that. So when you hear about machine learning, that's kind of the basis of it. Exactly. I always, people always think that, it, it's funny because my son works for a company that does, teaches STEM, right? Writes, he writes programs and the Chinese had went to this company that is called RoboThink and they teach kids how to do robotics and programming. It's like an early STEM thing. And they said, we want you to teach machine learning. And he's like, to six year olds? This is, this is like advanced math or because he knew what it was. And then we're like, oh yeah, we just like, no, it's, it, it's cool, right? It is, it's really good. And here's an example of, a case study, we're getting into the case studies, these are real world examples. And this one is, has a lot to do around um, some mach machine learning. And it's interesting enough because what these, what, when you make peanut butter, one of the key things when you roast one of the parts of the process, all makes sense, right? You roast peanuts. The color the peanut is, is huge. And it's not just for the look of the peanut butter, it has to do a lot with when you roast it, certain things chemically happen to it. It has to do with the quality, the texture, the moistures, all this going together. It is the lead indicator. If you get this color coming out of a roaster, you will get this result, right? It's a huge quality parameter. Okay, real simply put. So what they had done for years, they were customers of ours, and what they had uh, had a regular, you know, manufacturing skate HMI system, and they were logging. You know, even back in the day, they had them on circular charts, but they were logging their process parameters so their operators could adjust set points. And I was like, they had years of data of this is how we ran our process. When they ran their process, they had a quality group, right? The quality group went over, picked up some peanuts, and rated the color. They disposed the product. Right? They said, okay, this is good. We're, we can use it in this batch. Oh, this one's a little dark. We're going to have to put this, either get rid of it. Which chances are they always reuse it. They'll just use it. We're not using it in this grade A product. We're putting it in grade B, right? Things that are normal when you make stuff. Then one day someone said, we got to do better with it. We got to control this color. And they went to a seminar much like this around IoT, and they learned about predictive analytics and you know uh, data scientists etc so he went to their base in Louisville he went to this professor at Louisville said if I give you all this data could you model this and tell me some something the guys like of course he's like well let me show you the process the guy said I don't care I know what I need to know you have some variables that you know have something to do with it and you have some results I'll be able to tell you I'll put some math together Gave it to their students. It was a gr great project, right? If you're in college, having a real world example, two weeks later, comes back and goes, knows nothing about making peanuts. Here's your model. Let's implement them, put them in place, right? Because it's just math. You know, really, if you think about it, you have the data, you have the results, you're gonna, exactly what I showed you before, you can come up with it. Is it perfect? No, but it's powerful, right? Right now, if you're looking at it saying, you're making this, make these adjustments, right? They, they, they basically went from probably about 80, they thought they were really about 85 to up our 80s of really having good quality results to almost 100%, right? Because you had good visibility into what was going on. All it was was they put some math models around it and predicted what it is. Now that sounds really cool, and I'm gonna tell you something really powerful about this is, and it's a step, right? It's an evolution. Then someone got really smart and said, wait a second. There's a lot of ways we can make 7.2 color peanuts. You know, it's a great, they actually is a zero to 100, a zero to 10 scale. We can make that. One of the ways we can do it is, I can either run the conveyor slower or increase the temperature to make it darker or decrease the temperature, change the air, there's all these things we can do. Real simply put, think of roasting. What's the number one cost in roasting? Much like I said the airlines was fuel, what is it? Fuel. Fuel. It's utilities, right? They figured out I can slow the machine down and leave it in longer and make the same product and reduce my energy costs. The negative to that is I'm making less, right? Making less than out. Well, they it's roasters, it's like boilers. You don't turn them off. You can, but it's a big deal. You want to keep them at temperature. Getting them up and down, bad things happen. And the roasters had more capacity than their lines did. So they didn't need to run them. If they ran them 
and they literally would. They'd run them 16 hours a day. And the other shift, they wouldn't even, they'd keep the roast running, but they wouldn't run any peanuts through it. So he goes, well, why don't we just run them slower with less utility? And their utility costs dropped. An interesting thing that came out of that, it's kind of like if you ever smoke meat, you slow cook stuff, the quality actually, same quality result, looks the same, but it goes up. So here it is, they took that same data and they reused it again to optimize what they're doing and reduce their energy costs. 32% in their roasters. Right? But think about it, I just told you the story without the number. It didn't matter what the number was, right? It's value, that's what it is. It's taking the, now what did they do? Was it about the data? Was there value in the data? No, it was someone had the foresight. We have this problem. I would love to reduce that. How could I do it? And keep that story as we go through this in mind. Quick note, this is not Generac, but they're in Milwaukee, and I'm not allowed to say who this is, so we'll just, good way to put it, but generators, right? You go out in the field, this is IoT, this is remote, right? Cellular, out in the field, these are in people's houses and buildings, doesn't matter. Conceptually, what they want to do is that when they started this was when a bad thing happens, an alarm happens, we want to notify our tech so they go out and fix it. Simple, right? It's kind of why IoT starts. Something bad happens, I fix it. Then they started gathering more information. They were just able to start to predict. Kind of like the pump thing I told you, right? If I look at some things, I'm going to predict that something bad's gonna happen. And I'm gonna predict the likelihood something's gonna happen. So before it breaks, before our customer gets pissed off at us because their generator broke, I'm going to send a tech out there and have them fix it. And even more so, what's the value of that? Because if it's very likely to break, I may send someone out right away. If it might break, kind of like your AC, you gotta tune it up, right? Eh, get there when you get there. Get there in the next couple of weeks, great. So now they can say, hey, when you're already out in that area, Go hit this other one because it could use some attention. They became more efficient in their service. Their brand went up because they weren't breaking as often. Their quality went up. Then they went a little bit further. Again, they started to realize if we make certain adjustments based on what we've seen, what do generators consume? Fuel, right? There's cost. Then they started selling to their customers saying, hey, we can optimize your generator. We can have it run in an optimal state and reduce your fuel costs. We'll do that as a service. We'll sell it to you as a service. Customers are happy, right? It's that same thing. It's, it's an evolution. It's, you know, react, break, fix, everything like that. I talked about the pumps earlier. Evolution, right? We did a simple thing of pump alteration. Take the same environment. Now we're going to predict the maintenance, right? So before I just watched ons and offs. Then I add in bearing temperature, wet well levels, amper draws, all those other things like we talked about, right? Then I'm going to add in some other things. It's a weather forecast. How much water is coming in? What's the capacity of the station? If of those three pumps, I'll go down to two, what's the capacity? What's the likelihood that I need that capacity? Because what's the one thing a sewer district does not want to have happen? Rain. Well, they actually don't care about rain. There's the one thing that they really don't want to happen. Flood. Backups. No one, no sewer district wants to get a phone call saying, my sewer just backed up in my house, and by the way, it's your fault. Right? One, it's EPA and regulatory. They really don't like that, but they pretty much have to pay to fix your house if it's their fault. Right? Other than that, if they want to optimize, right? I want to keep, I want to reduce my energy because that's really all they do. They just have to not flood things and use as much money as they, need, they can. That's how they operate. Their model is very simple, right? Keep the assets up and running. <laughs> Spend as little money as possible. And that's how they do that. It's like, we just got, what is important? They have a concept of critical assets, right? If this, this thing, I, when I send someone out, if there's a chance that I'm not gonna have the capacity and it's gonna rain, I gotta go fix that one. That other one, maybe it's not running as efficiently as possible and I'm losing energy money, but I'm not flooding people, which ones do you go to first? They use those analytics to really optimize things and really figure out what is the best place to do, because by the way, they get 
they can do about 2,000 work orders and they can have 6,000 of them outstanding. They gotta pick the right ones to do, make the right decisions. Take that a little bit step further. This is the peanut butter manufacturer. This was their next thing is they, they, they uh, interestingly enough, they became really efficient and really making a high quality product. They made really good product. They were making it very efficiently. They, were, they started selling more and more of it. They ran out of capacity. Great problem to have, right? I can, I'm able to make so much and sell it that I've now ran out of capacity. I have more demand for my product than I have the capability to do. So the first thing they do is we gotta add more capacity, right? But that takes time. What are we gonna do in the meantime? You can't, you can't meet demand, you gotta do something. So what do you do? Let's figure out who we're not going, to, we're gonna get rid of as a customer, right? That or you just piss everybody off, that's not a good idea either. I'm good at that. My wife tells me I'm good at pissing everyone off. But. <laughs> so they got all in a room, they got, this is fun, think about this, sales, engineering, process, operations, the same room to come to a consensus on which customers we fire. Sales goes, well, first thing we're gonna do is take the ones we know are bad and the ones we're good. Two popped up, the USDA and this company in Japan. Sales guy goes, well, this is a commodity. The USDA, right? It's the cheapest stuff we sell. Yeah, we gotta make it because it, they'll accept almost any ingredient. So if we had the waste stuff, we can usually mix it into that as long as it's safe and good product. That's why it's cheap, right? They'll take whatever it is as long as it has it's simple things, certain amount of peanuts, certain amount of oil, and a certain amount of sweetener, and a, a, it's only so much salt, blah, blah, blah. And then you had this Japanese company that bought, I love this, at $4.50 a pound. The materials cost 35 cents. USDA costs about 30 cents. They sell it for about 50 cents a pound. Who's keeping Japan? Okay, these are the people that know the, the, the simple thing, only two people because all you other ones are going, okay, there's a twist to the story, right? Who's keeping the USDA? Who's paying attention? Everyone's waiting for the story to finish, right? What happened, if you think about manufacturing, it makes sense even if you're not, the Japanese product had such requirements where they had to flush lines out and they had to do all these things, they had to waste a lot of product because, you know, gotta keep all this thing is. It was a very specialized product, they had really short runs and horrible changeover times. So they'd make 20 minutes worth of product that took five hours to set up. So there was all these variables that were locked in their data of how the products ran, their changeover times, all this information. They compiled it together and they started to go, wait a second, we're losing money on this. We're, we're literally, this is our worst customer because of all those other variables. And it's just, it was a matter of just putting the data this in there. And interestingly enough, guess what happened on their cheapest product? Because it had literally just the opposite. We'll take the, the, the stuff that was rejected from that great Japanese one, and I can just add it in this product. And I just gotta, you know, fill up the drums and mix it all together and put it in jars and the setup time is nothing. I can literally, all I gotta do is, I don't even have to change anything in the line. I can just put it in drums. By the way, the packages were not, little jars, they were drums of data, right? I'm gonna ship this out, right? Completely opposite of what sales did, but they believed it, because they sat and they looked at the data and they did it. So they fired 50 customers. Great number. Bottom line, same thing, right? Their bot top line went down, their, uh, I get this wrong. Their, I'll say it the right, their sales went up, or sales went down, their margins went up tremendously, 12%. Made you think about that. If you fire all the ones that were making you lose money and you sell more, now I'll take the optimizing thing. Guess who got enabled with some great data? Sales. Sales knew these SKUs, what the real cost was, right? They knew when they had negotiation room and when they didn't. They knew they could get aggressive when their competitors couldn't. I know what the real cost is. And it's still assumed, right? It's not a real, real cost, but I really have a good feel for it. I know what I can get aggressive when I can't. They became lockstep with operations, saying, what business do we go after? So interestingly enough, when they got the extra capacity, increased their capacity 50%, they had even more capability. They didn't lose that margin. 
They're now, they knew which customers to go after and which ones to stay away from. So the, 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 we talked about it. those are huge numbers, right? And it makes sense, right? Does anyone, you know, anyone not believe the story, right? It makes sense how they use the data to add value in what they're doing. Last story. Or case studies, stories that actually exist. Oil drilling, right? How many people have seen the movie Armageddon? Come on, if you haven't, you're probably lying, right? Drilling through an asteroid, that same thing, right? Well, what'd they do? Oh, you gotta back it off. Oh, it's a big dramatic scenes, and I can't remember the guy, the big, the big fat guy that gets blown into outer space and dies, right? He goes into a, 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 a he's drilling into something, and oh, he hits his pocket, I'm gonna punch through, and you know, blows up, and there he goes, and oh my gosh, the world's gonna come to an end, and then AJ, you know, I always get upset, you know, Ben Affleck, he doesn't blow up, the, you know, the other guy gets blown up. Same thing, oh, I'm gonna push through or whatever. It's the same concepts, right? You don't know, there's a lot of variables in how you do things, but if you model this thing, and it's interesting enough, all these models were developed by a PhD in Brazil who really knew oil drilling, but he's a PhD. It's kind of like the guy that did the peanut butter thing, right? He had all this knowledge and all this data and all this other stuff, but you need to enable it, right? You gotta get the sensors. Susco can give you the sensors, right? Patsoft is the software they use behind this, right? It doesn't, it's just, it's, it's, it, they enable these tools to allow people to optimize how they're drilling, to know when to back off. It tells them you need to make this adjustment. And by the way, five feet later, you have to make another adjustment because your variables that you cannot control are not there. You can control how fast you drill. You can control how, you know, how much is the RPMs. You can control how much you're pushing down, all those things. There's things you can control, but you look at that data to kind of optimize how they're doing things. And they get a lot out of that, right? You're not blowing things up, safety. Um, you're, but it's all the way up to optimizing, right? And that's part of um, the story as you go through all these case studies is you start with, you know, this is, a, this as a note is a maintenance thing from 12 years ago. I'll tell you how much things don't change. Manufacturing journey, go from reactive, break fix. Something breaks, we fix it. Moving up to proactive preventative, right, to predictive, and then interestingly enough, the one that's not there, you're right with it, it's prescriptive, right? Let's go ahead. I, yeah, you guys want this presentation, I'll give it to you, but absolutely, if you want to take pictures or you want me to e email you the whole presentation with scripts, absolutely, right? This is good educational stuff, so. That's I am that this and just about every other presentation they actually have available on the app, which you can actually download as a PDF. There you go, I didn't know that. Did you know that, John? Now, interestingly enough, um, this is another one that came for years ago, right? This came from GE, right? It doesn't matter who it came from, we get one more. But look at the right. They were trying to tell you all the things, all the way from break, fix to optimize, right? None of this stuff has changed. This stuff's all 15, these are all presentations. No, we were reps and I've been in this, this, this space in manufacturing software for 25 years. Um, I'm grabbing old stuff and I'm saying the same thing, right? We're trying to run optimize. When you're not running, you're losing money. When you're running, you're making money, but your goal is to be optimized. But it's all part of a, a, a journey, right? So real quickly, if you look at that journey of running to optimize, it showed you all those case studies. They did it step by step by step. The power of IoT, the value around everything that they do, right? Transforming data into actionable information and value. It's all real simple stuff. We all laid it all out. You believe it, right? Well, where do you start? First thing I'll tell you is, what was the root of all those stories? What was the root of everything we did? They had some, no, they actually had some data, right? They started with some data. Google started with some data. The key thing in the data was a few things which are important. Time series data. The reason we say time series data is time series data is usually things you can control. Right? The pressure, the temperature. Some of it you can't, the weather. 
right? But they're, they're the things that you can control, but you kind of need to know those. Can't know when it looks like this, right? The one we showed looks like this. I'm probably making some good product. Now, to make those predictions, you need to know what happened. What was the result? That's event data, right? And I will tell you right now, manual data, comments, other things, it's all information, right? You need all that. Now, what I will say is if you look, and this picture to the right, reason I brought it back up again, time series. How many people have ever heard of a historian, a process historian? What is a process historian? It's time series. How long have they been around in manufacturing? Long time. Is there time series up in the cloud in IoT and Google? Sure, there's great tools. I don't care where it goes, you just have to have the data. I don't care if you put it in a process historian and you export it to Excel and hand it off to a PhD. By the way, that's what the peanut guys did. They had a really old, actually not even a good historian, they had a really old one that pretty much you had to get data out, you had to export it out. It didn't matter, right, it's data. The event data, they had no idea these two were correlated, was in their quality system in the quality department in a access database. Doesn't matter, right? It's just a day. Now that you have it all, you can you turn it into actual information. You use the tools, that's the cool thing about IoT is you now have these great tools. You know, you don't have to hire PhDs as much anymore. It does help, right? True data science. That one, the oil drilling, pretty complex modeling to come up with these complex models. Probably need a good data scientist, maybe, but all those other app ones I gave you, all those other, the pump one. That was an engineer who I happened to know the guy. I don't think the guy ever passed a math class in his life. I don't know how he ever became, uh, he's technically a tech, right? He knew also math with, but he understood their process and he understood how to solve problems. That's why he's a good engineer. He knew how to solve problems. And that's my last point. The success of IoT, one is you gotta have the data. That's where you start. Because we talk about, if you look at projects, if you don't have the data, how, how are you going to make a decision? You need the data, so that's where you start. But the value doesn't come from the data, right? It's when it turns into actionable information. The key way to start is start to identify things you want to solve. I have a capacity problem. I want to send my maintenance guys out less often. Solve a problem. That's the value, right? And then, by the way, don't just solve a problem. Iterate, do a few things, right? All those case studies I t told you about, they all started from a really simple issue that they solved using data. That's why a lot of times people say they want to look back at the present day and say, wait, I want to read that case study in because they'll say, wait, oh, okay, now I get it. Because there are some common mistakes that people make in IoT. And I will tell you, and I'm guessing Sean's gonna agree with me, and I'd love to get your feedback. Avoid these. Some of them more than anything. One is two, number one. How many people have ever heard of Six Sigma black belts, things like that, right? How many are Six Sigma black belts? Anyone has one? You know them, right? What happens a lot of times in the old days is they'd run a Six Sigma project. What's the first thing they would do? They go to the line, they start what? Collecting data. They'd spend all their time collecting data, then later make a decision. You start to, if you start to collect the raw data once the issue is defined, you're gonna, you need data, right? We, if you have one data sample and you're trying to make predict something, how are you gonna, you know, you need hundreds, maybe millions, right? You need data. So that's why we say start by collecting data. If you don't think, you're, if you think you may need it someday, just collect it. It's a different era back now. Data does not cost that much. Storage does not cost that much. We're getting more and more efficient. I don't care where you put it. I don't care if it's in the cloud. I don't care if it's in your plant. It doesn't matter. Collect the data. Number two, may not be that obvious, but it's the number one failure of IIoT projects. Which, by the way, anyone want to guess at the consensus number, give me a guess, of IIoT projects that are considered failures? That's probably a little high. The consensus is it's way over 50%. Boy. Way over, and it's probably, he's probably right, right? And it's interesting, because the people that said they have IIoT, it's way up there. You know why they fail? Because people collect data. And they think the data is gonna magically solve some problems. <laughs> right? 
data by itself does not solve it. So don't go into this saying, one, you need the data, collect it all, I'm telling you, use it, but then start solving problems. It's not going to magically solve itself. It's possible. You could get it, send it to some guy. You got to put some, going back to that context thing, right? You got to put some context. You got to give it some space. It's not going to magically solve itself. You can't throw a million tags of data up into the cloud and go, tell me how do I run optimally? Hey, think about that. That's impossible. So don't think it's going to give it value by itself. Data by itself will do that. You need context, right? Next one is tackling too many issues at a time. No one's arguing with that, right? But that's normal. I'm going to collect all this huge amount of data and I'm going to tackle all these issues at a time. Then there's the other side of that story, ignoring what I call the IIoT life cycle. Did you remember all those case studies? They all started here, then they went here, then they went here, and then they ended up in this really cool space. Because interestingly enough, you looked at it, they collected the data, they had the information, right, around some issue, and they didn't stop there. They went to optimize. That's the one I, I put the optimize. They kept going, I already have all this context and I have this knowledge, keep going until you feel like it's optimized. Great example, I'll go to you right now. Um, as we're finishing, I'm oh, doing pretty good here. Amazon. How many people know when Amazon started? What did they do? They lost money, right? They were losing money. The old adage, I'm gonna sell it at a loss and I'm gonna make it up in volume. Idiocy, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of. Has Amazon changed their model at all? Are they now starting to make money? <laughs> kind of. Doing a lot better than they used to. They are the largest corporation, right? Interestingly enough, what they did is they didn't change. They said, I'm going to do things like one day shipping. Two in fact, actually, they're getting more insane, right? It's no longer two day. It's now same day. They're becoming more insane on their cost. I am going to do something that's at a lot. It makes no sense. No one can do this and make money. But what did they start doing? They started optimizing that insane thing. I'm gonna get more efficient at it over and over and over and over again. What happened? They got better and better at doing the insane thing. Now all of a sudden, what happened? I can do this without losing as much money. No one else can do that. The reality is the ability to ship stuff over, it's killing people saying that now they have to compete with, I have to figure out how I'm going to compete with Amazon. Now Walmart's going, oh, I'm going to ship to your house. I'm going to hire all these people, right? They optimize their supply chain. They hired their own people. They learned from UPS on how to do the routes, right? They optimize the insanity. And the funny thing about it is they didn't change what they were doing. We're selling at a loss. The selling at a loss, we're going to make it up in volume. And they did it. Why? Because they, they optimize the volume. The really weird part about this is, what is the most profitable part of Amazon? Anyone know? Appreciate if you look at it, nope. Amazon Web Services. True. They are the largest cloud supplier in the world. No one knows it. But you know why they did that? How do you optimize, what did they do? They optimized all this data, they gathered all this data, they optimized, they had a whole team. You, you go to some colleges and you talk about the jobs, right? Google, right? I'm going to be a data scientist. I'm going to be a techie. It's Google. You know who's the other one? It's Amazon. Because Amazon is constantly using what we're talking about here to optimize what they're doing. And they're getting better and better and better and better. And interestingly enough, we think of them as someone that I, you know, order something that shows up at my house. They've gotten better and better in how they do things. That's the value of IoT. And optimizing things can literally, like all good, right? I'm gonna fire my best customers. You do weird things, but what it is, you understand what's going on there. And that's the really value about it. I mean, I, if you would have told me 10 years ago that the model of I'm gonna do something to loss and make it up in volume was gonna make sense and turn into the biggest company in the world, You'd, you'd go nuts. And I just told you, there's, there's some, some things around it. That, now there's a lot of variables, right? They've gotten better and better and more efficient, and they've actually started doing things at less cost. The big thing Amazon has over it is who the hell, who's going to be able to do it? I've spent all these things to optimize that if you're not optimized, you can't compete with me, so I can just kick your butt. And that's what they're doing. I mean, they're growing 
at some point, you know, the government's going to break them up. They're doing so well in what they're doing. So, with that being said, with my little clock tells me I have two minutes to go. Uh, we have a half hour before the next group gets in here. I'm going to be around. I'll be at the Tats Off booth if I'm not around here. Um, anything you guys want, any questions, any comments. Real quick, I like to do is goes, did, did, there were a lot of people that didn't know about IoT. Do you feel better about it? Did I demystify it a little bit? Some of the ones that know it, you know, hopefully it, it, it added value. Yeah. Do you have um, government authorization? Me personally? Are, are you, do you have a working relationship with the government? We, at various levels, you can, we can, I'd have to understand what that means in detail. Okay. Um, we do, I have like, I have some clearances, okay. et cetera. Um, but if you give me that, that's a, that's a big question. Right. Yeah, I have some, but I don't know what you need. We have work, worked at Nukes, DOD, stuff like that. Okay. Um, so, anything else? Okay, John? Yeah, thank you, Bob. Uh, just to Bob's point, a lot of people kind of freeze like a deer in headlights when they think they, they want to do an IIoT application, but they really don't know how to get started. Because they know they have to collect a lot of data, but they don't know what to do with it. So that prevents them from collecting data in the very first place. So that's the first step, is to collect the data. So thank you, everyone, for joining. We have certificates of completion up here. In case this matters for your work uh, place, you can have uh, this submitted. Um, to your manager, for example, you just put your name. It's already signed with the date, and it also applies for one PDH hour. So you can come up here and pick them up if you like. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob.